this video, we're going to look at this analytic solution for one-dimensional unsteady conduction. From that, we'll look at an approximate solution, and we'll also compare it with numerical methods and show that these solutions are useful for verifying that our numerical methods are working. Let's consider a plain wall situation where we have a wall which is subjected to a convection coefficient and an ambient temperature on either side of the wall, so it's a symmetric problem. We're going to assume that we have one-dimensional conduction through the wall, so we'll look at the conduction along this black line drawn here. We'll say that the cross-sectional area is constant, there's no area changes in this, uh, and that the conductivity of the material is constant, and there's no generation within the wall. We'll notice that there's an axis of symmetry in this problem. The center line is our axis of symmetry because the boundary conditions are the same on either side, and therefore we can look at only half of this solution. As a matter of fact, we've already solved this problem numerically. Of course, when we developed a solution for this problem with a heat flux going into the bar and a convection coefficient at the end of the bar, that's perfectly applicable to this situation. All we need to do is realize that on an axis of symmetry, the heat flux is zero because it's an axis of symmetry, and so we can use our existing numerical solution by simply setting the boundary condition here that Q is zero, and we're looking at this region here, half of the wall going out to the dimension L for any desired convection coefficient and ambient temperature. We're looking for an analytic solution, and if we remember our heat conduction equation in one dimension in Cartesian coordinates with a constant conductivity, we got this expression here. 1 over the thermal diffusivity times the time derivative of temperature is equal to the second derivative of the temperature with respect to x. Because it's an unsteady problem, we need an initial condition, and we'll say that the bar for all x at time 0 is given a constant initial temperature Ti. We have a boundary condition at the x equals 0 surface, that is the heat flux is 0, which means the temperature gradient is 0. And finally, at the end of the bar, at x equals L, we have that the conduction coming out of the bar, the heat flux given by k dt dx at x equals to L, is equal to Newton's law of cooling, the convection coefficient times the temperature at the end at any given time, minus the ambient temperature. In order to get an analytic solution, we're going to non-dimensionalize the problem. We're going to use the reduced temperature to do that. You've seen that before, where theta is equal to the temperature minus uh, the ambient temperature. And we'll normalize that or non-dimensionalize it by looking at the difference between the constant initial temperature and the ambient temperature. So we'll get our theta star that is just our reduced temperature over our initial reduced temperature. We'll non-dimensionalize the position using uh, the length of our, of our wall, or the half length of our wall L. And the non-dimensional time is, of course, our Fourier number. Uh, the thermal diffusivity times time divided by L squared is the Fourier number, and that is our non-dimensional time. And if we use that non-dimensionalization, we'll find that our equation simplifies to this. Of course, the thermal diffusivity that appeared in our dimensional equation got absorbed into the Fourier number here, and we got an L squared term coming by non-dimensionalizing the x here, which came up there, and our thermal diffusivity at times the time in the time derivative, and that L squared gives us the Fourier number. And so our equation is simpler. It's just in terms of our non-dimensional temperature, our non-dimensional position, and our, non and our Fourier number, our non-dimensional time. If we look at that solution, it's a function of three things. Of course, the position. That's what we're looking for in this solution. But it's a function of these two non-dimensional numbers, the Fourier number to start in the time behavior, and the Biot number, which is going to tell us about the spatial variation of temperature within our object, within our wall. We'll see that shortly. So that analytic solution is done by the method of separation of variables. I'm not going to go into any details about that, but what you get is a Fourier series solution. So the non-dimensional temperature, as a function of any Fourier number, is given by this infinite series which is called the Fourier series, and the coefficients that go into this infinite series are given by this expression here. And in order to evaluate each of these coefficients, we need to solve a transcendental equation. This zeta tan zeta being equal to the Biot number is what we need in order to get this constant in order to evaluate all of this. We also need this root to evaluate this term in our temperature. And so while we have an analytic solution, there's no easy solution to this. This is called the transcendental equation, and we're going to use numerical methods to solve this in order to evaluate our analytic solution. Let's explore the behavior of the solution. First, I'm going to look at that uh, equation, zeta tan zeta. 
because in order to solve this, we need the roots of this equation to evaluate all of these terms. So I plotted here for two biot numbers, a biot number of 1 and a biot number of 0.1 in red. And so what we're looking for, if I, if I rearrange my equation to zeta tan zeta minus biot, biot, that needs to be 0 to find these roots. And so we're looking for the zeros of these equations. And I can see from this function that looking at a biot number of 1, the first positive root is here, the second positive root is here, third positive root is here, and it's different when we have a biot number of 0.1. So any different biot number will give us different roots of this equation. Fortunately, it's quite easy to solve this rather than reading this off a graph each time. We can implement a function in order to solve this. What we're looking for is a function that is zeta tan zeta minus biot. We want that to be zero. And so we're going to find the roots of this. We'll use the built-in functions in psi pi in order to find the roots of this equation. And I can ask for any number of roots I want. I do need to supply an initial guess. For all the cases I've played with, this initial guess to find those roots seems to work quite well for all, all that I've looked at. And so, using this uh, technique, we can very easily look at a uh, biot number of 0.1, 1, or 5, and we can look at any number of roots that we want. I plotted here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 roots of the equation. If we use this with any different biot number, we'd get the, uh, the numbers that we need. So I've incorporated that into a uh, Python function in order to evaluate this analytic solution to the unstructured plane wall. And so it simply solves the roots of this equation, and then it evaluates those c coefficients for any number of terms that I want, and then it returns um, the theta i for that particular term. Once I come out of this function, I will sum those up in order to get the solution that I want. Let's take a look at that. I'll use it for a, a problem where I have a cross-sectional area based on my width into the screen of 1 meter. I'll say that the section I'm looking at has a height of 1 to get that cross-sectional area. I'll look at an L of 1 meter. Q in is, of course, 0. And I'll use an initial temperature of 30, an ambient temperature of 30, and I'll take the properties of aluminum, giving me a thermal diffusivity of 9.7 times 10 to the minus 5 meters squared per second, and a conductivity of 237, and I'll use a convection coefficient of 100 watts per meter squared Kelvin. That results in a biot number of 0 0.422, and we can always go from our non-dimensional time to our physical time using our definition of the Fourier number, and so I'm plotting a lot of things at a Fourier number of 0 0.005, which is an early time in the changes that we're going to see in the solution, and that corresponds physically to a time of 51.475 seconds. And so here's what the first term of our analytic solution looks like. We know that this is an unphysical solution because we can see that the temperature at x equals zero from the first term of our analytic solution is below our temperature. Our ambient temperature is hotter, and so this, this wall is warming up during the course of, of time. Let's look what happens when we add more terms. So here I plotted on the right-hand side the first term approximation and the second term approximation, and of course that the, the the two-term approximation is the sum of these two things. So there's my first-term approximation, and now I'm going to correct it with this function here, which when I add those two together, I'm adding the non-dimensional temperatures and then scaling them to the physical temperatures so we can see what they actually are. So it doesn't look like those add up, but in fact that is adding these two terms in the non-dimensional uh, solution and then scaling them to the actual temperatures. So our second, our two-term solution looks like this. And what we're doing it is correcting with a function that looks something like this. And it's still clearly not a very correct solution with two terms. So let's see what happens as we add more terms. With three terms, the green line is our correction after I've scaled it to dimensional terms. And that results in the sum of the first three non-dimensional terms scaled, giving us this solution. It's starting to look a little more physical. Of course, I would expect that the temperature at the center at this point is 30. In fact, I would expect that it's 30 through most of this wall, and then it's going to increase where we've already been exposed to the convection boundary, and there's been energy transport into the bar, into the wall. So let's continue uh, adding terms. With four terms, it's getting even better. There's still some waviness. With five terms, better still. Six terms, seven terms, and at seven terms, it's getting pretty close to what we expect, but there is still a little bit of waviness there. Let's look at it, what it is with 10 terms. With 10 terms, we pretty much have the solution. We have this straight line section where the energy has not yet been transported into the wall from the warm boundary condition out here, and we've reached up 
to a fairly warm uh, temperature as convection is coming into this bar right at the end. If we look at different times, our Fourier number being our non-dimensional time, if we increase uh, our Fourier number, we see that we get a solution. The, the energy is, being, is propagating further in. We're seeing the influence of that hot boundary propagating further in. And at a Fourier number of a little less than 0.1, it has been transported all the way to our uh, x equals zero coordinate, and we're starting to raise the temperature of the center. Notice that in every case, these, are, these slopes are zero at the center line, as it must be, because our heat flux is zero. And we're seeing the temperature of the end rising as it's exposed longer and longer to the hot uh, convective boundary condition out here. If we plot the temperature at the center of the wall in blue and the temperature at the end of the bar, x equals L, in orange, we can see that there's, and we'll plot it against Fourier number, so we're looking at the time behavior here, we see that there's no change in the temperature for a certain period of time, and during that whole region, we expect to see across the bar that there's a very straight section in the solution. The temperature profile is a flat 30 at the initial condition. The end of the bar, it rises quickly at first, and as it warms up, the heat transfer into the bar gets smaller and smaller, uh, and as time progresses, um, the rate that heat is entering the bar is decreasing because the end of the bar is getting closer to the temperature of the ambient. So up here in the smaller graph, I plotted over the, a range of Fourier numbers up to 20, and we can see that somewhere at about a Fourier number of around 15, we've reached our steady state, or very close to it. Certainly by 20, we've reached our steady state, and this temperature is no longer changing. Because our convection coefficient is relatively high, the end temperature that we reach is very close to the ambient temperature of 100. Okay, now I want to look at, the, at an approximate solution. If I look at a later time or a later Fourier number, let's start with 0.3 for our Fourier number. If we look at this later time, this is where the energy propagation has gone all the way from the hot uh, convection condition all the way to the center of the bar, and we're already seeing a, a rise in temperature here. Now a single term solution compared to a 10 term solution is really close. So you're already getting a very good approximation of the solution once the energy has propagated all the way through our material with only a single term, and that's of course a lot easier to evaluate. If we go further in time, Fourier number of 0.4, the agreement is almost perfect, very, very close to perfect with a single term versus 10 terms. And that means that an approximate solution is very well obtained for later Fourier numbers by looking at just one term. So instead of an infinite series, we have that our approximate solution is just C1 times zeta 1, and we only need our C1 constant, and we only need the first positive root of this equation. You can find in some places uh, these C1s and these zeta 1 values tabulated, allowing you to use this approximate solution as long as your Fourier number is bigger than about 0.3 or so. Certainly by 0.4, it's looking very, very good. Now what happens if we decrease the biot number? Here I have a biot number of 0.422. I increase the thermal conductivity of this to an unphysically large number, I think it was 10,000, in order to get a biot number of 0.1. And notice that I plotted these on the same scale. So here was our original biot number of 0.422. We're plotting at the same non-dimensional times. And you'll notice that as the biot number is getting smaller, the temperature variation in the bar is now only 5 degrees. Now, as this number gets smaller and smaller, you'll see that there's no variation in the bar, and you would be getting to the case where the lumped capacitance analysis would be give you a perfectly valid solution, as you'd see no variation within this bar. So already at 0.1, we're all within a 5 degree variation in this case. By 0.01, you would see almost no variation. And there's our 0.01 solution. Now we have less than 1 degree variation within that entire wall section. Now we can compare this with our numerical solution. We've already developed that function in another video. And if I compare at very low biot numbers, I'm using eight terms in my analytic solution. And the analytic solution shown in orange has definitely got some waviness trying to approximate that straight line section. It's very hard to approximate a straight line section with uh, trigonometric functions, which the Fourier series is doing. The numerical solution has no difficulty whatsoever. However, the blue line is perfectly straight and it has very good agreement, but those wiggles aren't there. As I go to higher Fourier numbers, so going to 0.4, where I really only need one term of the analytic solution, we see the agreement between the numerical method and the analytic solution is virtually perfect. And that gives us a very powerful tool for validating and verifying our numerical methods. I can see how many 
what size of control volumes I need to use in my numerical methods to get a, a suitable degree of accuracy, and then I have confidence extending that numerical method to, to handle situations that I cannot do analytically. So these days, most T-transfer problems are going to be solved with numerical methods rather than looking at these analytic solutions, but they're still very useful for quick back-of-the-envelope engineering calculations, which we want to do before we're terribly invested in a problem, and they're wonderfully useful for making sure that our numerical methods are working correctly so that we can do even more complicated uh, things with our heat transfer analysis.